got it. Start, wait. People are coming in. Okay. Hello, everyone. Here we are for another climate talk by Porto Protocol. I would say that today, the topic that brings us here is the most important of all. I heard a sentence very recently that someone told someone that why worry about climate change when we're pro we'll probably run out of water first. Now, I know this is very radical, of course, but the fact is, as we speak as a team to wine produce producers all over the world every single day, no matter where they're tuning in from, water is by far their biggest challenge. And in most cases, we hear about the scarcity, although in some cases, we hear about the excess. And in most cases, again, we hear what to do if we are running out of water. And in other cases, we hear suddenly water poured out of the sky. And what do we do with that as well? How is it going to impact our vineyards? So I want to thank Sushma for being here hosting this talk today. Sushma is tuning in from the UK, from Deep Planet. We have all the way from Argentina, we have Luis Reginato from Catena Zapata, from Mendoza. We have also all the way from South Africa, we have Rosa Kruger from Rosa Kruger. Rosa works with a, a myriad of vineyards. And right here next to us, we have Juan Esteve joining us from Spain, from Heimat. So I would introduce to you, as I generally would for the protocol, as a sharing knowledge community, but Sushma is a member of ours. Deep Planet is a member of ours. So Sushma, the stage is yours and I'll leave it to you to introduce Porto Protocol. And I'll leave to each of our guests today to introduce themselves and give us a glimpse on the terroir and the climate on where they're coming from. So without further ado, I wish you a wonderful talk and I'll see you at the end. Thank you, Sushma, and thank you all our guests. Thank you, Marta. Um, it's, it's such an honor and pleasure to be here. I admire the work of Martha and Christina in building the Porto Protocol Foundation and bringing together such an extraordinary group of change makers and practitioners who can question and share best practices um, and tips and insights to help each other and the rest of the community. Um, I am the co-founder of The Planet. We are an agri-tech company from the University of Oxford here in the UK. Uh, we started the company with the vision to harness artificial intelligence for the benefit of the wine industry. And just going back in time, our first project was in monitoring soil moisture and subterranean moisture in the vineyard. And we've been working with wine growers for the last five years uh, to improve sustainability in their vineyards using various data sources. But uh, most importantly, I have the pleasure to be with such brilliant panelists here today who I will uh, pass on uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, Luis, would you uh, uh, go first? Yes, hello everybody. My name is Luis Reginato. Uh, I'm the vineyard director in, in a winery in Argentina, in Mendoza, uh, called Catena Zapata. It's owned by a family that has been making wine for more than 100 years. So today, very focused on sustainability and, of course, elevate the, the Argentine um, wine quality. Um, in, the, in the case of Argentina, uh, in our region, is the, the water is a problem because it's very scarce. We don't have excess of water. We have, have the opposite. Um, we have a, a long experience um, dealing with that because Mendoza is, is a desert. We get around 200 millimeters of rainfall a year. So uh, the irrigation is part of our culture. You will see, if you come to visit Mendoza, you will see the city and all the, the oasis full of canals that distribute the water from the rivers. And that started, started by the natives here, the Huarpes, then the Incas, and then the Spaniards and the Argentinians. We have been performing, building new dams, uh, and distributing the water through canals. So it's very, um, very cultural, the irrigation in, in our region. Thank you. Um, Rosa, do you want to go next? 
Yes, good afternoon. My name is Rosa Kruger. I'm from South Africa. I am um, the founder member of the Old Vine Project, which um, aims to preserve vineyards in South Africa <clears throat> older than 35 years and to promote what we call planting to grow old. So we're teaching, trying to teach people, farmers or farm workers especially, to plant vineyards in such a way that they will grow old, that they can it to 50 years old and still produce a sustainable crop. Um, South Africa is a very harsh climate, as you all might know. We have lots of wind and cold. At the moment, it is absolutely freezing here. The mountains are covered in snow. As I'm sitting here, I'm freezing. Um, and I've been freezing today in the vineyards. Uh, it's an arid climate. It's very cold or very hot and, of course, extremely windy. Um, we uh, have... Uh, most, most of our base vineyards are dry land farmed. So it's gobelet, bush vines, <clears throat> bush vines, which you call in France gobelet. And it is um, in very quite acidic soils. So we, and our soils are very old and very um, erodible. So we really, really have to take very special care of our soils um, to get any kind of decent crop. We've had almost had day zero in Cape Town a couple of years ago. We, there was almost, no water for people in the city of Cape Town. We've had uh, four years, three to four years of extreme drought. We're a little bit better now, but um, the forecast is by the climatologists, and I work with two very good climatologists in South Africa, is that we're going to get three degrees hotter by 2050, and we're going to get up to 25% drier. The climate is getting drier. We, had, we do, there's really some really good work done in South Africa on climate change. Um, it's a per area prediction. So I can say to you, this is probably what's going to happen on the west coast of Africa, where now only rains normally annually 300 millimeters per year. That's not really enough. And I can tell you what's going to happen in areas where I work also, where it rains at 1.2 meters a year. So it's a very, very, very climate. Um, and there's lots of things we actually try to do to preserve water. But I'll tell you about that later. Thank you, Rosa. Really good topics. I'll come back to you. Um, Juan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Joan Esteve. I am the general manager of uh, Raimat Winery, which is part of the Codor New Group. And Raimat is a quite unique uh, project because uh, one of the founders of Codor New bought this farm in 1914 when it was a desert. Uh, it's a, a situation similar to Luis described in Argentina because um, we have a very very weak soils with salinity problems and on the top of the hills they are stony soils with good drainage but uh, very dry soils too. We have an average of 250 millimeters per, per year and this year much less. So uh, we are in a situation where, where drought conditions are, are very strong and, and, a, and also it's a, a hot uh, hot during summertime and very cold in winter time because we are in a continental climate uh, situation. Uh, but the good news is that uh, we get uh, melted snow water from the Pyrenees. So um, uh, we have a very good quality water through, through dams and channels that brings the water since uh, 1914 when the founder bought what the farm. Raimat actually it's a very big farm, it's uh, around 3,000 hectares of farm that 2,000 of them are planted on vineyards and uh, we grow everything under, uh, under organic production and of course because of this situation water for us has been one of the main issues that we have deal uh, during from the, the origins, no? because uh, especially this year, that uh, is, if you don't know, in, in Spain and probably all Iberic uh, area, it's a very dry situation. Actually, the, the channel organization has cut up to 75% of the water delivery 
So we are only irrigating uh, 25 with 25 percent of the available water that we have uh, usually. Uh, the dams are uh, very very low. It's uh, they are around 30 percent. So we are in a in a very uh, drought situation, and of course, thanks to uh, many years of research and and management of uh, vineyards with minimal water has is helping us uh, to sustain the production that we are in 20 days more or less we are in Barazon we will be in Barazon so we are in a very critical situation uh, just before harvest uh, but I guess that from now on we we will indeed on, on all those aspects Thanks, Juan. I think there is um, so much to learn um, from your experience and really glad to have all the three of you here. Um, as we all know, I think climate is both a friend and a foe to the winemaking industry. Uh, water is a critical resource, and which is really why we're all here for both environmental, social, uh, economic sustainability. Um, and I think, uh, uh, as we know, vulnerability to freshwater resources is expected to increase. Um, uh, to for extreme events like heat and drought. So given that, you know, drought is a growing concern uh, in many parts of the world, and Rosa, I come to you because uh, we just spoke about uh, day zero. I know South Africa has faced uh, such critical water sh shortages when uh, the city of Cape Town ran dry of water. I heard that there were signs saying water is our lifeline. Um, and the lack of water has become such a big problem that some grape growers who need to irrigate are even like thinking about what's the long-term viability of the crop uh, in this region, right? And so what did you, um, I guess, how did you uh, face this challenge or what did you do when you almost ran out of water? Um, also, how has, you did speak a little bit about this, but how has climate change affected water availability and you know what methods and practices are you using? Um, which hopefully will help a lot of our listeners here. Um, I could keep you busy for three hours, but I'll try and sum it up quickly. We start with design. We start with designing new vineyards. We use some scientific tools to our, to our ability, which is a, a, a satellite studies um, that predicts, the, gives you the slope analysis, site analysis, like the slope, the gradient, the temp, the uh, radi uh, radiation from that slope, you know, whether the slope is convex or concave, there's it, it, about 12 different maps that you get, and you just start designing according to that. Because, of course, you'll plant, we'll rather plant on south or southeast facing slopes. That's cooler than north or northwest facing slopes, because our, a lot of our vineyards are on, on slopes. So we start with design. We speak to this, the climatologists here on long-term predictions. We see where there's not going to be water, where it's going to be much hotter. We try to avoid those areas. And we try to move to areas where it's going to be a little bit no, more normal, which is um, unlikely. But there are areas that's going to, the rain is going to be the same or similar than what we've had the last 50 years. Uh, secondly, we go to, we use Tara Klim, which is the, um, the GIS uh, uh, woman called Tara Southey. She's fantastic. She does a GIS study. She interprets your site. And of course, we talk to the farmers. Uh, that's, the, that's how we start with design. But then, of course, we also learned a lot uh, um, from old vines in South Africa. Why would some old vines to 100 years and still bear a, a sustainable crop. 100 years in sand, dry land, no water, in quite dry areas and quite hot areas. And they still, they just carry on, they have a memory and they, they seem to be able to survive. So we're doing a lot of research on that from the University of Stellenbosch and others. Um, then we also, the, we, of course, like the rest of the world, we look to the new buzzword international, I know is regenerative farming. We do a lot of soil work. We try to improve the quality of the soil with many different methods like cover crops, like not, of course, not using, using herbicides and pesticides and definitely not insecticides as far as we can. And of course, in South Africa, the leaf roll virus is a huge problem. We have a virus called leaf roll that um, 
limits your quality as well as your quantity. So if you have leaf roll, you take off <clears throat> up to 30% less crop and you take off up to 40% less quality. So there's, uh, the Old Home Project uh, tries to promote what we call keen planting. So we, we plant vines from a known nursery that are known to be virus free. That's all the vines, one by one, are tested for virus. So if you start clean, you have to stay clean. So how do you stay clean? You stay clean by going more organic. Uh, but the one that's a lot of people in the world do that now. But the one thing we do here, I think that's that's specific to our area is we plant with the contours. Um, that is a new way, and uh, I've been doing it for uh, some 15 years now. We've had five farms designed like that, and it works like a dream. We look at the natural form and shape of the land, and we design vineyards, not more than 80 meters between two contour channels. It's much like the old people used to do that before we had tractors and, and chemical fertilizer. But it's difficult to describe it. Every time I try to describe it, people don't understand it. So it would have been nice if I could show uh, the slides. Um, but it's against the slope, 80 meters apart, and every 80 meters there's a channel on the contour on a little bit of a drop, a little bit, one, 200 meters. So for every 100 meters, uh, there's a one meter drop. So the water doesn't run, it doesn't erode, it just, flow softly down the contour into a, a, your local dam. So we try to harvest every drop of water that falls on the land via contours to, to a dam. That also, of course, because the rain doesn't wash, the prediction for South Africa and for many places in the world is that we're going to have floods rather than soft rain. At the moment, we can see it. We've had serious floods in South Africa for the last two years. So the other advantage of contour planting is because you work uh, with a soft um, contour, the water also sinks into the land, so it raises your water table. And then, of course, we um, promote um, uh, wetlands where you sanitize the water and reuse the water. So it goes from one dam through a wetland into another dam and it sanitizes the water of any possible chemicals that could land up in the water. And uh, then the last thing we do is we teach. We, we do a lot of teaching of farm workers. In South Africa, of course, there's a, um, I think internationally maybe, vineyard workers are not, well, I can't talk for other countries, but I can talk for my country. The vineyard, talk, vineyard people are not, not taught viticulture. They never go to school, a viticultural school or college. So we've been trying to teach people viticulture and make them understand that water is an absolute, it's like gold. And the last thing we do, which is part of regenerative farming, is we mulch. So a lot of our vineyards are planted in a wheatland areas, where there's wheat or rye, rye, rye or barley or some, uh, uh, canola. So we use the, the um, dried up straw we pack it on the between the vines and we preserve like that. So one farmer has told me a couple of years ago, he's had history, he's had done this now for five years. He told me that he's preserved up to 60% more water just by mulching. We also tried to farm with smaller canopies rather than the same crop level, but smaller canopies, smaller leaves. But that's particular to South Africa. I can't. Uh, I've been to Argentina, I've been to Catena, uh, Sabata, a couple of times, a fantastic place. I love the, the estate. Um, but I can't, I've never worked in other countries. I've harvested there and visited, but I never worked there, but I can speak for my country because there's, not, there's few areas in this country that I haven't worked in. So that is what, at the moment, in a short um, summary of what works in South Africa. Great, thank you, Rosette. Um, really useful insights, and hopefully, I'll be able to summarize all these key points towards the end. Um, Juan, I, I, I'll come to you. I know Raimat's, uh, uh, and you just mentioned as well, uh, history has been in sustainability, um, starting vineyards in some of the most arid lands. 
and it's also turned into one of the largest wine growing estates in Europe now, which is quite interesting. And your work um, uh, using integrated methodology caught my eye, um, which includes new technology to easily manage irrigation to drive uh, maximum water efficiency, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, similar to some of the things we're doing at Deep Planet, working with growers who are using technology, not just to detect water leaks, to, but to observe uh, water level changes underground um, to inform some of the irrigation decisions. So I know um, I know you have a similar method um, or some, some, somewhat similar to harnessing uh, water from, I, I believe even Rosa does some of that water from the mountains. So I wonder if you could speak about some of your experience in handling water scarcity, uh, I guess using technology and also harnessing uh, water through different methods. Mm -hmm. Well, as Rosa said, uh, we could talk probably two hours about all these topics. Um, but uh, try to, to, to summarize, um, one of our main issues that uh, we have been working the last 20 years it's uh, managing variability. I think that this is one of the problems that is uh, everywhere in every vineyard. And uh, variability management is, is what, what uh, has given us a, a lot of work, let's say, no? Uh, Rosa said, um, we have already mentioned most of our irrigation blocks to match them to soil variability because this soil is what it has the biggest impact in uh, water management to plants because the, the soil is the way it holds the water and uh, releases the water when the plant needs it. Um, so we have done a lot of work uh, this redesigning our, our, uh, our blocks according, according to soil. And not only that, but also uh, applying different strategies based on those soils. No? For, to, to give you a fast example, eh? um, in a vineyard, for example, that is in a slope, that the, the soil in the upper part, it's only half meter depth, and in the bottom part, it can be two meters depth. At the beginning, we, we used to irrigate, let's say, 20% more in the upper part and 20% less in the bottom part. And the following year, we, we couldn't find a single difference, no? And we reach a, a level where in the upper part, we can irrigate two or three times more, and in the bottom part, zero, for example, no? And it's when you start seeing any differences because the soil effect on the plant is so big that to, to um, uniform and, and to, to make... Um, uh, or to reduce the variability in, in the vineyards. Um, the irrigation is a very powerful tool, but uh, you have to be very aggressive to, to start uh, creating differences. No? For example, in a year like this, that we have not much water, uh, we are promoting the irrigation in the, in the weakest areas and uh, no irrigation at all in the deepest uh, soils. No? And you see that nothing happens. And, and because uh, that, that, that's probably the other axis or where we have done most research the last 20 years is, is trying to understand the impact of the stress on the quality of the grapes. No? Uh, trying to, to get uh, different strategies uh, is not the same, let's say, a Chardonnay for a Cava producing or a Cabernet Sauvignon for... Uh, uh, long aging in barrels. No? Uh, the, the irrigation strategy is completely different. Mm -hmm. And is one of the things that I think we have learned during these, these years, doing a lot of research on that. So once in one side, we have the strategy is where we want to move the vineyard in which direction and how much stress do we, do we want to get in one of those uh, blocks or varieties. And on the other hand, we have the variability on the soils. No? and how we can get uh, this stress uh, based on the different soils we have in, in our vineyards. No? This would be a very fast summary of all the work of the last uh, 20 years. No? But this would be more in the level of moving from research to application. But in parallel, we have done a lot of work in our infrastructure. Uh, because, for example, um, we used to receive the water through an open channel uh, 10 years ago. 
So we transform all the open channels to pipes. So now we receive the water with natural pressure and no need to pumping uh, for irrigating. No, it has been an investment of around 4 million euros that the payback of that was more than 50 years. <laughs> so it was not easy to convince the property to do that investment and it's not common to be in a company that can, can uh, make this kind of investments. But from a sustainable point of view, we have uh, moved from spending a lot of power for pumping for irrigation to almost zero power because uh, the water it comes through uh, natural pressure. And in addition, we have uh, less uh, water leakages. So uh, we have noticed uh, a savings of up to 15 send water just to avoid the evaporation from the channels no? and the leakage from those. So infrastructure is, is a, an important point. And then uh, the research in the other side to support the decision making day by day to apply. The concept would be to apply the, the, uh, uh, just the water that is required in each vine, in each corner of the vineyard. No? And, and to, to reach the, the quality of the fruit we want to expect from each vineyard. This would be very fast <laughs> to summary, let's say. Thank you. Um, uh, quite useful, but if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to post um, and, and, and we'll be, uh, hopefully the panelists uh, can answer all these questions uh, in the time we have. Um, but uh, coming to uh, Lewis, uh, I don't know if I'm getting it right, but I think you're known as the water guy, if I'm not wrong, uh, who's always looking to save water and we need, we def definitely need. Uh, I, I prefer water guy and not Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> well, either, um, way, either one, we need more of you. So uh, <laughs> uh, I guess, uh, I mean, we're talking about the most arid regions in the world, right? And we, I think you mentioned already. So one of my questions was, how is climate change affecting water in the region? But I guess we'd also love to hear um, some of the research that you're doing at Katina Institute, and uh, how how this is, how can we use this to apply to other regions? So so basically, so the watchers can take away something of your learnings and research findings and apply it to their own vineyards as well. Okay, I will try to summarize a little bit um, the concept of water need and irrigation for us here in Mendoza. And also I will pick some ideas from Joan and Rosa that um, I agree and I, I, I feel very familiar with what you are doing in your regions. Um, so first of all, you know that the vine is a living being and need water or die. How much water depend on the climate? So the, how much water the vine need depend on the climate. If you are in a very warm region, we'll need more water, right? Cooler region need less water. There is a, there is a concept of evapotranspiration that is the need of, of the vine for water. And it's affected by the temperature, the humidity, uh, also the wind can affect the evapotranspiration, as uh, Rosa said, uh, and the sunlight. Also, more sunlight need more, then will be more evapotranspiration. But another important thing is something that Joan mentioned, that is the, the growth and yield, and, and yield aim that you have. Mm -hmm. It's not the same if you want to produce 30 tons per hectare, or if you want, if you want to produce um, four tons per hectare. Of course, if you want to produce more, you need more vigor, there will be more evapotranspiration and you will need to feed these grapes with water, right? You need more water. So how much water the vine need will depend on the, the climate and the, the aim that you have, the goal that you have for your vineyard. Higher yield will need more water, lower yield will need uh, less water. But then um, where is the water coming from? can come from rain in Mendoza, just to give you an idea, just 4% of the surface of the province of Mendoza can be planted. We can do agriculture. 96% are 
mountains or desert. We are in the foothill of the Andes. So in the west side of the Andes, you have Chile between the Pacific Ocean and the Andes. In the um, east side of the Andes, you have Mendoza. So these high mountains block the humidity coming from the Pacific that stay more, mostly in the Chilean side. And Mendoza is very dry. So we get water from smelted snow that, and, and glaciers that uh, form rivers and is where the water come from here in Mendoza. Uh, the climate change um, is affecting in the way that glaciers are getting smaller and smaller. And we, we can have some snow in winter. We, we have snow in, in winter, but it's melted fast. So most of the water in the rivers come from the glaciers. And with the uh, climate change, is they are going back, these glaciers. So we are facing a scarcity of water, basically. Um, and irrigate and rains uh, is interesting to analyze because if you have a little rain, mostly we get the rain in summer. If you have, let's say, five millimeters, seven millimeters of rain, it's like zero because it will evaporate. And to the root zone, nothing arrives. So it just, it doesn't count. If you get 80 millimeters in two hours, maybe, I don't know, 60% runoff and you is not hold in the soil runoff. So um, there is some rain here, it's not zero, but effective rain is little. Let's say 100 millimeter a year, 120 millimeters a year. So very low. Um, and then uh, I will go more technical, but uh, how the the where is how the vine get the water? Get the water through the roots that are in the soil. So going to Joan, I will give. Uh, well, I, I I want to go to those two ideas that I like from from Rosa. And one was that she said um, they are teaching in South Africa that water is uh, as important as the gold and maybe in the future will be more important than the gold because I, I'm almost 50 years old, but younger generations or what I'm seeing in the last 20 years, they cannot drink gold. <laughs> you cannot irrigate with gold. We need clean water without salinization uh, to produce uh, food and wine, of course. Without wine, no happiness. And, <laughs> and without food, we, we cannot survive. Um, so it's as important or more important than the world in the future, in my opinion. Um, and also she said that the, um, something, if I get it, is that like, what I said at the beginning, uh, depend on the, the growth and the vigor in, of the vines that you want will be the need of water. Mm -hmm. It's not the same one hectare of vine. It's not the same the need of water if you produce four tons or 40 tons per hectare. Mm -hmm. um, and going to about what uh, Juan was saying um, about the variability and adaptation of the drip irrigation system to this variability in soils. Very important because um, the water is stored in the soil and the soil is, is not storing the same amount of water in, in the different type of soil. Um, there's something called water holding capacity and it depends on uh, the texture of the soil, soils with more lime and clay store more water than soil with the sand. Of course, rocky soils store less water. Uh, organic matter also play a role. Usually soils with more organic matter can hold more water. Um, and then the, the depth of the layers, like if you have a soil with 20 centimeters of sandy soil and then rocks and stones will store less water than if you have two meters of sandy soil and then the rocks. So the depth of each, uh, each layer with his uh, texture, the organic matter, 
everything will create a, a water holding capacity map, ideally, of your vineyard. And then you can put over that a, a design of drip irrigation, and then you can um, deliver the amount of water for each parcel with a, a different water holding capacity. And I think it's more rational, the, the way uh, of um, water use, something uh, related with the precision viticulture. It's, I think is the idea of what Joan was saying. And, and of course, I agree. Areas with stony soil, if you irrigate a lot, you lose most of the water underground. Um, in some areas, maybe just need less water because can retain a lot from the rain or every drop that you apply will be used by the vines. So this is in general. And then going to some um, actions that we are doing in Mendoza. Uh, in the winery, we have an institute called Catena Institute where we do a lot of research uh, and we try to publish um, because most of them are, are I think important for the for the region for Mendoza. Uh, many some things you can use in other regions, but some things need the local climate and soil and culture because it's it's need to be tailor made for the place. Uh, one important change has been using rootstocks that maybe in Europe is common uh, for phylloxera mostly here. Um, there is phylloxera here, but very located, very in, in localized uh, soils with a lot of clay. But for some reason that we don't know, the phylloxera cannot complete the cycle, cannot uh, fly. So basically it's not affecting much the vineyard so far. So most of the vineyards have been planted on rooted. New plantations, new vineyards, we are using rootstock that are um, tolerant to drop, like 1103 Paulson, 110 uh, Rich, Richter, and 140 Ruggeri. So those um, rootstocks that mostly come from the uh, Vitis rupestris blood um, give a vigor to the vines, and they have a very strong and deep root system that can explore more soil basically and and get more water from the soil um, a second thing is uh, adapting the drip irrigation system something similar of what joan said uh, trying to have a different valves in the drip irrigation for different uh, areas in the vineyard with similar water holding capacity um, and about the um, um, water uh, irrigation strategy, we encourage the vines to go deeper in the soil. So during the winter, we try to fill with water the soil that is our reservoir of water, the soil, until four meters of depth. And then we encourage, and then during the um, spring, we don't irrigate until summertime. So the vines try to extract the water that we put it in the winter, and then when it's try to dry out, they explore deeper soil. And it's a way to, to teach the vines or encourage the vines to explore deeper soil and then have the capacity to have a more water when they need. Um, and, and, and Luis, excuse me, I don't know if I can interrupt, but yes, yes. Rela related to that, um, uh, uh, do you have any salinity problems when yeah. Because I yes, know that Mendoza area is a quite saline area and and the, the bulk of the drip uh, that makes, uh, it generates a lot of salinity around the bulb, no? Mm. Um, yeah, you know, well, of course, the, the drip irrigation pro produces a, a, a bulb underground. And in the borders, you can start to store salinity. Depending on the river where the water comes from, you have more, can have more or less salinity. Usually aquifers are very low in salt, but the river depends. And then it's something that you have to, to take a, a lot of care to measure 
because usually in in summertime you start to store salinity in the border of the bowl and then during the winter it's important to wash this salt down but very important uh, because when you have a lot of water it's not a problem but when you start to have less and less water the salt concentration go up there are some rootstock that also are adapted to higher salinity and it's, it's important to have that tool and then just to mention two um, like something that we are uh, doing research uh, right now. One is the subsurface drip irrigation. So it's, a, it's the pipe of uh, drippers underground 40 centimeters between the rows in the middle. Uh, we are analyzing one of the things important is the salinity. Um, but uh, the advantage is that you avoid evaporation that can be 10%. So you, you save 10% of the water. Also, Mendoza is very dry, it's a desert. So if there is no hum humidity in the surface, the pressure from weeds is very low and you can establish weeds that are natives and consume very little water and then to control the, the weeds, especially in the, in the vine row, we are also moving most of the hectare to organic. So we don't apply herbicides. And, but the pressure of the weeds is very low because they don't have water. You don't get water in the surface. So the seeds uh, cannot uh, produce a, a weed. And the other important, um, Technology is the mycorrhizae, uh, that is a group of fungus that work in symbiosis with the vine. Uh, probably you heard about mycorrhizae, I don't know if I'm saying the word right in English, but it's a group of fungus that uh, live in the soil, uh, produce a symbiosis with the root vine, uh, and they extend the root system because this IFAS from the fungus can absorb what help the vine to absorb water and also uh, unblock some nutrients. Like in, in my region, pH can be eight. So it's high P pH. There is a lot of uh, limestone, uh, calcario, calcare. Mm -hmm. And for example, phosphorus is blocked, mostly blocked for the vines at that pH. And this uh, fungus help the, the um, I mean, they produce acids that unblock the phosphorus for the vine. So I think this is, uh, we are doing trials with different mycorrhizae and we think that they can help the vines to, to live with less water and um, also help them with new nutrients. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Yeah. Uh, very helpful. And I think, uh, we, as you said, we probably need a lot of time to discuss all these topics in a little bit more detail. Um, but just moving away uh, from irrigation, and we did speak about soil management as well as uh, being one of the most important practices that may influence water availability uh, to the wines. Um, some some uh, actions include uh, conservation of precipitation water, you know, reducing evaporate transpiration, uh, improving ground cover, mulch, as we spoke about. Um, what we've, we've what we've seen is, uh, or maybe you have some inputs into it as well. And going on to the next question on about smaller growers, uh, at Deep Planet we've seen a number of uh, small growers who are wanting to monitor what kind of evapotranspiration is happening in the crop, um, identify areas where there's an imbalance of uh, soil nutrients or carbon or uh, that require better attention either through cover crops or other regenerative practices. Um, and what's interesting is some others are even looking at mapping what the future climate would look like to start adapting uh, the grape varieties in the face of climate change, right? And it's encouraging to see growers adopting uh, more and more of this, as they say, like adopting all the tools that's available in the toolbox um, to help us uh, fight, uh, fight climate change. So I, I guess coming to any of you, um, all the three of you, 
uh, you're coming from different geographies, different growing conditions. Um, I guess from your point of view, what, what is the role of soil uh, biodiversity and grape variety uh, in water resilience in the vineyards? Feel free to start, any of you. Go, go, Rosa. May I comment on the two previous speakers? What um, I totally agree with what both of you said. Um, during design, we look at soil analysis, we do serious soil analysis, so soil surveys in South Africa because we have so little water and our soil is so poor. We do a soil analysis, fun. we do a water holding capacity tests, we do irrigation designs, we choose our rootstocks, and we do irrigation scheduling based on soil type, variety, and of course, what you mentioned also is the price point of the wine. We have vineyards where I'm involved, where we harvest 20 tons a hectare and we irrigate a lot. We also, where there is water next to the rivers, but we also have vineyards where there's no water whatsoever and we irrigate, we harvest four or five tons a hectare. What we do, um, in Afrikaans, I'm Afrikaans, it's a, it's a sort of a, a bastardized language, I love my language. We say if you don't, if you, if you don't measure, you, don't, you can't know. So we do, and most of the vineyards, we do serious soil moisture testings. We use a lot of neutron probes. So before any, we don't use a lot of irrigation, unfortunately, in most areas. We've learned during the previous grant that we can actually get away with much less water if we just measure. Thirdly, the uh, um, mycorrhiza, the healthier soils, the less water you will use. The healthier your soils, the more water holding capacity your soil have, has, and the less erosion you'll have, of course. The less erosion you have, has, the more porous the soils, the more carbon rich the soils, the less water you will use, and the more water the soil will hold. Um, Rootstock, we, we work with different rootstocks, about nine, ten different rootstocks, according to the soil type, according to the variety, and according to the price point of the wine. So if you want to use a, um, a champagne club, anyway, there's a, there's a lot of different factors in that regard. Um, soil management, we just found the healthier your soils, the better, the um, uh, better, for heat spikes. In South Africa, heat spikes is a big problem. We sometimes get four days, that's about 38 degrees, 40 degrees. And if the climatologists are right, we're going to have 45 degrees in, in 20 years time. Fortunately, I won't be around at that time. But if, we, if you have healthy soils, they seem to be more resilient against climatic stresses. So that's the one thing we go for is healthier soils. We've also learned from old vineyards um, to prune in a certain way. We prune old vineyards to healthy sap, to healthy shoots. But that's a completely different topic. What, uh, soil management, you asked about soil management, that's very important. Soil analysis is important. The way you turn the soil is important if you turn the soil. The way you mulch is important and the way you read the moisture in the soil is important. I completely agree, and I think the soil is the basis of, of uh, everything. So that's why it's so important uh, to keep the health of the, the soil. In our case, we are coming from uh, desertic origins and uh, salinity and sodicity problems on our soils, especially on the bottom part of the valley. And we have been using cover crops uh, the last uh, 40 years in, in our vineyards. And uh, the last 20, I would say that we have introduced most of um, uh, regenerative uh, practices uh, to regenerate the soils. Uh, for example, not, not only producing organic uh, wines or, or grapes, but also uh, adding, for example, uh, to to have mulchings uh, below the, the vines and, and to man sustain the humidity. And as Rosa said before too, that uh, it, it saves a lot of water, avoiding evaporation um, 
when when you drip irrigate uh, directly on the line. And in addition, depending on the mulchings that uh, lately we have done a research very interesting that using mulchings coming from from pine trees, uh, we don't need to cultivate below the vines for five years. Uh, so it's really surprising. It's it's a little bit costly, but if you see the global benefits of that, uh, you don't need to cultivate anymore, and it saves a lot of water and it maintains the weeds away from from the bot from bottom of, of the vine, no. And also the management of cover crops. For example, this year because we have this drought problem and we couldn't let them to grow too much because the more biomass you produce, the more water it it, it takes out. But uh, in a standard year, we can leave cover crops up to one meter and a half high, and especially uh, grasses. And then uh, we pass the roller crimpler uh, instead of of mowing the, the cover crop, just layering it on the soil and creates a layer that um, holds the, the humidity much better in the soil. No? So ma many practices that in a long term run, it improves the organic matter, it's a reservoir of, of uh, insect uh, that control other pests. So at, at the end is a question on having a better balance and, and having more biodiversity in the soil and also mycorrhizas that naturally grows and everything it's much more healthier and you need less inputs to sustain a crop versus a not healthy soil. No? So I think the soils need to be paid a lot of attention. But again, one of the problems that or problems of focus we are having in Raymat is that you cannot treat all the soil in the same way because you have a variability in soils. No? So many times, instead of applying mulching in the whole block, we only apply in the weak areas, uh, not on others, and try, trying to to move everything to a more uniform, uh, more uh, balanced uh, situation versus uh, its its origin. No, and sooner by sooner, you are you are noticing improvements that everything is much easier to to cultivate. Thanks, Juan. I think there is a specific question on what type of pine tree that you use. It's, it's coming from the chat. What? Which kind of? Uh, pine tree. Oh, it, it's 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 um, it's it's just the, the rest from the um, I don't know how it's called in English where they cut the pines and make the 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 the, the biomass to to. Uh, to, when, when you, instead of using gas uh, to make heat, you use uh, mm. uh, biomass. Uh, well, the, all these places where they manufacture it, the rest of that, the, the, what they, what they threw, throw away, uh, is what we apply. It's, it's, it's not a specific part of the pine tree. It's just uh, anything that comes from the places where they cut the pines. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's another question. Can we assess how long it takes to regenerate the soil to allow the water retention and the health of the soil, health of the wine? This is from Virginie Duru. Um, would anyone like to take it? How long it takes, uh, it's very variable. <laughs> uh, depends on the soil, the situation or the problem and how, how bad or how good is the soil. Um, uh, I think there is not a single answer for that, but I don't know if others have more experience on that. I think <clears throat> if you don't stop using herbicides and insecticides completely, no herbicides and insecticides and pesticides is the big thing. Um, within four or five years, you can start regenerating your soil. That's in my experience in South Africa, depending on the soil exactly. And just one more thing to make everybody um, think on a different level, which we do in South Africa, is some of our old venues in South Africa have been resilient against climate, the climate, the changing climate for the last 150, 140 years. So, you know, we are all very clever. We are very clever scientists in the world, but I think plants know better than us. They, they've been around, if you've been around for 140 years in South Africa in this wind and sun, you have to have some kind of um, a survival instinct. 
So we've been taking cuttings from these vines and propagating them. We clean them up from virus with a special system in the nursery and we propagate the material from them. And it's a, it's a whole project that we've been working on for the last 20 years. The French is, uh, some of, one of the French nurseries, Antarp is working with us. And like Dr. Etienne Nietling, he's a fantastic young uh, professor in, so somewhere in France. Like you see, some of these vineyards in South Africa have withstood the climate for so many years and have really shown us that the climate is resilient and leak, uh, uh, use and need no water, uh, uh, no rainwater, because in these, most of our old vineyards are planted on sandy soils at high density. Now, how is that possible? At high density on sandy soils and in old riverbeds. We don't know what that means. We're doing research on what that means. But if they can survive for 140 years in sandy soils with very little water at high density, we, we somewhere in our calculation of what we should be doing to become more water smart is wrong. Thank you, Rosa. Um, sadly, I think we're coming towards the end. Um, and uh, uh, maybe a final remark uh, from the panelists, but also just keeping in mind that, you know, Porto Protocol Foundation is all about driving actionable insights that can be used on the ground, right? Every day, people are asking for recommendations and actions. And I, I think you guys are key. And someone is reminding me here on chat as well. So actionable takeaways, uh, uh, that's what we want to cover. So maybe a final remark, but also uh, what would you, um, for smaller growers, especially who are uh, who are listening, uh, who need to irrigate or sustain their business and they're facing water shortages, right? I want to post a question here, like how would you uh, say you're putting your shoe, yourselves in the shoes of a small producer, what measures would you recommend for him or her to take. Um, I think that would be very useful. Um, any of you would like to go first? Well, I think that you need to know the, the evapotranspiration of your region and you need to know the amount of water you are. Uh, like in in my region, you get water from the river and you, you, you have to measure how much water you get. And this is a very old law attached to the to the land because you get the water from a canal that has been there 100 years. So you have to measure your demand and your supply of water. This is the first thing. And then of course, if you can do a soil mapping and understand where you need to apply a bigger, a bigger amount of water and when you need to apply less water, but more frequently, that's, that's important to be more efficient using that water. And about the question of generate the soil, I mean, the can we assess how long it takes to regenerate the soil? Regenerate, I mean, the, we, we should go deeper in the definition because if I compare in Mendoza, the vineyard that has been planted 10 years, 24, 100 years and the natural landscape that we have. We have more um, biodiversity and more um, organic matter in the agriculture soil than in the virgin land because you add water and then there are more insects and microbes and, and, and biomass compared to the desert. So it's relative, it's, it's for a deeper analysis. Thank you, Luis. Um, anyone else, Rosa or Juan? Yes, uh, well, for us, I would say the most valuable tool that, uh, at least for me, that every year I expect to see is um, the bigger map, um, but not, I, would, I wouldn't recommend in vineyard uh, use the satellite uh, bigger map. I would recommend to use um, a map that can be segmented and separate the values of the pixels of the vine versus the soil, because if you mix both things, uh, you get to a wrong conclusions. No? And I said that for me is the most valuable because every year I can see the dimension of the problem. No? And especially I would recommend to have it on horizon time 
that is is the time is when you get uh, the grades uh, in your exam no how, how good or how bad you have done during the season because uh, and if you do it every year at the, the first time you you realize how big is the problem no and where you have the problems and sooner by sooner you you try to fix all those differences all that variability and year after year you are uh, noticing how good or how bad you have done to move to a more uniform uh, management that at the end is the summary of all the things that we have we have said no so managing variability from my point of view is probably the most um, <laughs> difficult part in in our production because uh, vineyards different from other crops especially when you make wine uh, the stress management is very important and it's very difficult to apply the same level of stress to each vine. And it's very risky because if you apply too much stress, you lose quality and production. And if you don't apply enough stress, you lose quality. So it's it's a, a difficult and dangerous game. And you need tools that uh, give you a, a global view of the dimension of the problem. No? Sometimes uh, the sensors that you apply in a vine from my point of view, they are interesting at the beginning to, to understand how it moves the water, but in the long term run, uh, they are not too much use, useful from my experience. Thank you, Juan. Uh, Rosa, about one more minute to go. I agree with that. So two things, if you have water or if you don't have water, soil mapping is crucial. Plant according to your soil type, even if it's very small blocks, uh, then you can irrigate according to that soil type. And secondly, always measure your soil more water content. Don't irrigate if you don't need to irrigate and work on your soil health. That would be my three most important keys to a young or a new smaller farmer. Thank you, Oza. I think we are towards the end, but uh, thanks so much for all the panelists for um, uh, coming on the panel and kind of talking through your experience and lots of learnings. Uh, for me, it's been an honor to uh, host this climate talk, and uh, thank you, Martha and Christina. And Martha, do you want to take take it over? Sushma, thank, thank you very much, and thank you, Luis, Rosa, and Juan. This was so informative. In fact, we can. This is exactly the type of climate talk that we need and that we want because each of you really enumerated all the practices that you are implementing. And as we foster peer-to-peer -peer learning, we couldn't expect more. And so thank you very much for that. This was extremely informative and I'm sure we can withdraw a lot of information for this talk. We will be back on July 6th with the business, edi with the business edition of our climate talks called Sustainability and Profitability with the second edition where we already have two guests confirmed a host, a Portuguese producer, uh, Calçada Wines with Inês Mota, and uh, Seri Park from Italy, from Cantina Gotia. In the meantime, thank you, all of you behind the screen, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.